Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cutler, uh, uh, thank you uh, for being uh, here today. Uh, you know, programs and, and contracts like those in the Artemis support thousands of jobs uh, across the U.S. Uh, manufacturing supply chain. Uh, I'm proud that Michigan is actually one of the uh, top 10 states in aerospace uh, manufacturing. It's home to over 600 aerospace-related companies, uh, and we're looking for, to that uh, to grow considerably in the years ahead. Uh, it's estimated that the moon to Mars activities have generated over $20 billion of economic output nationwide. However, the president's budget creates uncertainty about the future, as you know, uh, for Artemis program in the after the next launch. Abandoning the, this program or disrupting the existing uh, project plan jeopardizes our efforts uh, in the space race, uh, hinders the development of our domestic aerospace supply chain, mm -hmm. and potentially leaves billions on the table uh, in uh, future economic uh, benefits. So my question for you, sir, is the, the Coalition for Deep Space Exploration has noted its commitment to supporting the inclusion of small businesses uh, in the NASA programs. And uh, in your experience, how have NASA programs like Artemis been beneficial to the small businesses uh, in our states and to our local economies? And, and what can we do to, to better support efforts to include more small businesses in this uh, important supply chain? Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator, for the question. If you look at Artemis, just the program itself, there are 2,700 suppliers for the, for the, that are part of the Artemis program. That covers everything from small mom and pop shops making valves, nuts, washers, all the way up to the big integrators. We can't have this program without small businesses. They absolutely are critical. And if you think about it, the these missions, they need every single piece to work. It's common to hear something like, you need a million things to go right for a mission to be accomplished. You just need one to go wrong. That stems all the way up and down the supply chain. And it starts with small businesses. They are making those initial components that make Artemis possible. So absolutely critical on the small business side. And I think as we go in, and talked about this a little bit with um, Senator Moran when he was talking about CRs, and that sort of thing, the instability that comes from uncertain funding, be it from a not knowing if we're gonna shut down, continue resolution, are we going to continue the program after Artemis III with SLS and Orion, all of these things insert instability into a business's understanding. And when that happens, maybe larger companies can weather that sort of thing. Small businesses, that's hard. And I'm at the coalition. It's a small outfit. We don't have a massive staff. And essentially, I run a small business. I understand what these small guys do. They're busy. If they're working, that's their lives. It's their livelihoods. It's the livelihood of their workers. Right. And if we're not, if we're not doing things to help them, I appreciate that's it. wrong. So Good. one of the you. things that we've done from the small business side, from the coalition, we've brought in some of the prime contractors. We've had them talk to our the members of our Right. Coalition, small businesses, what can they do? So Thank you, Mr. Carler. Thank you. So we want to continue to focus on that. There's no Absolutely. question about it. Mr. Uh, Breidenstein, uh, it's great to see you uh, here today. It was certainly uh, a pleasure to work with you uh, in your previous capacity as uh, a NASA administrator. And as you're well aware, in 2020, uh, the president signed the Pro-SWIFT Act uh, in, into law. Uh, I authored this bipartisan legislation to strengthen the nation's ability to protect uh, pre uh, pre predict severe space weather events and mitigate the harmful events. And, and I appreciate you championing that with me. You were very helpful uh, in getting that bill across to the finish line, so thank you. Uh, as you know, a space weather event can have implications for power systems, for GPS, other assets in low Earth orbit. And on Monday, the National Weather Service Space Weather Prediction Center actually just recently issued a watch uh, for a potential geomagnetic uh, storm, as you're aware. Continued research is uh, needed to strengthen our space weather prediction capabilities to ensure that we can have these accurate uh, warnings. Uh, unfortunately, the president budget uh, includes uh, cuts to this funding that could jeopardize these efforts and could have major implications uh, for uh, those uh, communication systems in particular. So my question for you, sir, is uh, could you speak to how NASA's science missions like the space weather program play a critical role in our everyday lives. This is non-political, this is straightforward. Why do we need to make sure funding for space weather prediction? 
It's uh, uh, there's a lot of different reasons to do it. Uh, just from a pure human spaceflight perspective, when we start putting NASA astronauts on the other side of the Van Allen radiation belt, in in orbit around the moon, on the surface of the moon, uh, those astronauts are in jeopardy of uh, things like a solar flare hitting them or a coronal mass ejection, uh, which would be, of course, even more devastating. And um, all of that radiation environment that the astronauts are exposed to would uh, would be devastating. In fact. Um, if you go back to Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin uh, narrowly missed being hit with, uh, you know, a, a solar flare that could have been devastating for their lives. So we, we didn't know what we didn't know back then. Now we have the ability to, to, to learn and predict. Thank you to you for your efforts to help us with that. Um, but beyond that, I mean, when you think about the, the capabilities uh, of our satellites in orbit, um, they become, in many cases, at risk uh, from a, 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 a coronal mass ejection or, or solar flares. So we, we need to be able to predict that. We need to be able to respond before. You know, it's not a lot of lead time. We're talking about a matter of maybe eight minutes or 10 minutes uh, to, to be able to respond to something like that. But the, the consequences of being hit with a Carrington event, which you know was a hundred and some years ago now, 140 years ago or so, um, but but if if that were to happen today, it would be far more devastating than even back then because today we're so dependent on technology, and all that technology would be would be put at risk. So I think it's important for us to be able to predict and respond and and defend our power grid and defend our critical infrastructure and a lot of that infrastructure, including. You know, command and control in space, including GPS, which is important for a timing signal for a whole, whole host of different capabilities here on Earth. Uh, we, we've got to be able to respond to that. And, and your bill, quite frankly, was right on point in helping us do that. Right. Well, thank you for that response. I'm out of time, but that's the, if you look at the cost-benefit analysis, to cut the relatively small cost and the huge uh, of the program and the cost to society, if we don't have the warning, is, is uh, astronomical. So I appreciate the uh, your, your comments. Literally astronomical. Yeah, yes. Astronomical. Yeah. <laughs> Senator Blackburn. 